You guys have no idea how happy I am to be back up here. Man, feels like it's been forever. I appreciate you guys praying. It's been a long couple of weeks. I just, I just keep on praying. Um, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for being able to stand up here again, Lord. Lord, I pray that you just move me as far out of the way as you can, Lord, that you would use me and that you would just fill this place with your presence, Lord, and that we would be able to get something from your word. That's what it's all about, Lord, that we would gain something, knowledge, or gain something to further and better our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, we're going to start on page 16. Does everybody have a new workbook? Have I got one? Okay. Um, it's going to be page 16 of the new workbook. If you're following your Bibles, you'll be in Psalms 33. We're going to be talking about the fear of God. I think fear is something that's really lacking today. It's something that, that, that we lack in the world, but I'm afraid that it's something we lack in the church too. I feel like it's something that we're lacking even as Christians. I think sometimes when you say that you've taken someone's kindness for weakness, that some people take God's long-suffering and His patience with us as some kind of, of weakness or, or, or a lack of His existence or a lack of His, um, his power. And I think that this lesson kind of like really takes it back to the beginning. It, it takes it back to where it all started and maybe through learning about what God has done and exactly how He did it and who He is, maybe that can help us to remember who it is that we serve and, and, and what He is capable of and the power He possesses. We're starting verse 6, Psalms 33. It says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of His mouth. It says, By the word of the Lord. It might be something hard to comprehend, but what that literally means is is that by the word of his mouth, when the word left his mouth, it existed then. From the moment he spoke it, it existed. Now, it, it said when he said, let there be light, there was no delay. There was no, there was no time when the light decided. It was when God said, let there be, it was. That's how, that's how God is. That's the power that he possesses. God's breath is amazing. If you ever study about the things that God breathed on, right? Well, first, his breath caused creation that's everything that you see, everything that you can't see. Everything that is, is because God from His breath created it. Then you have us. God picked up the dust of the earth. He breathed on that and it became a living soul. He, his breath brought life into the world. And then His Word. The words of God are God-breathed. That's what that means. That He literally breathed and the prophets wrote as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is God's Word that He breathed. So you have His creation, His children, and His Word. They all come from his, from just his breath. That's who you. That's the God you serve. That from his breath he can create everything that you know, everything that you hold dear to you. This Bible, your your family, your friends, the world you live in came from just him speaking it. There's this great Baptist preacher. His name was S. M. Lockridge, and if you look up his videos on YouTube, you can find some of his little snippets or whatever. He says all these really really great things. I love it. I love just reading some of the stuff he he said. But he said something that was so profound. I printed it off. And I wanted to read it to you. It says, God stepped from behind the curtain of nowhere onto a platform of nothing and spoke a world into existence. The reason God came from nowhere is because there wasn't anywhere for him to come from. And coming from nowhere, he stood on nothing. And the reason he stood on nothing was because there was nothing on which for him to stand. And standing on nothing, he reached out where there was nothing and he caught something when there was nothing to catch. He hung something on nothing and he told it to stay there. Then standing on nothing, he took the hammer of his own will and he struck the anvil of omnipotence, and sparks flew everywhere. He caught those sparks on the tips of his fingers, and he flung them into space, and he bedecked the heavens with stars. And nobody said a word. The reason nobody said a word was because there was nobody there to say a word. So God to himself said, that's good. That's who you serve. That's the God that you serve, is that he's able to do those things. He's able, all on his own, to create everything that you know. Second Peter 3... 2 Peter 3, 5 through 7 says, For this they willingly are ignorant, of that by the word of God the heavens were of old. It says, By the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. It says the same word that created it is the same word that's holding it together. 
His word is important. His word, what just the, just him speaking, just the word is holding this together. Now, that's the thing that's scary about it is, is that that same God, the same God we serve, the same God that did all these things, there's people in this world that treat him like he's a hobby. There's people that say, yeah, I don't really do that whole God thing. I've heard people, when you witness to them, say, yeah, it's just not, you know, I don't really do that. Like, it's something you do. Like, it's just something you do on the weekend or something you do when you're bored. Or That's not who God is, and, and He deserves so much more. And then you look around and you wonder why our country's in such a mess and why all these things are happening and why the world's falling apart. Because there is no fear of God. There's, that doesn't exist anymore. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So you can't even start without the fear of God. If you don't have the fear of God, you're starting at a deficit. And that you can't build a country, you can't build a family, you can't build a church, you can't build anything if you're not starting with the fear of God. People don't even want to agree that He exists anymore, much less fear Him. Verse 7 says, He gathered the waters out of the sea together as in heap, and He layeth, or he layeth up the, deep, the depth in storehouses. Let me explain something. This is something that is important to me. God created this universe. It was not a big bang. It, that's, that's a joke. It was not a big bang theory. It was not evolution. The God of the universe created the universe. It, it was by Him. It was through Him. The Bible says that all things were created by Him and through Him. And without Him was nothing made that was made. It's talking about Jesus. Jesus created everything. He created it not in millions and billions of years. The Bible dates, if you add them all up, is about 10,000 years. It was six literal days, not a day which is an age, which is a thousand years. God doesn't need that much time. God spoke it, it happened. He said one day, it was one day. He said it happened the second day, it was on the second day that it happened. I trust what God says, and when He says it, I believe it. So when He said it was six days, I believe it took six literal days. The ways that the, day, that the earth is even dated, scientists use about two different ways to date the earth from what I could find. I mean, there may be more, there may be uh, a broader scope of things, but from the things, all the research that I could find, this is what I found. The two main ways that they date our earth to even being this old or thinking all these things is one is carbon dating, which is how you, you take a, something that was organic and you can find the carbon that's in it now. They know how carbon breaks down, so if they know how much carbon was in something and then how much carbon it has now, somehow you can... Date how old or how long something has been decaying or how long something has been in existence. The problem with that is, two problems to me, is you're basically assuming what the carbon was when you started, right? You're assuming that the carbon was at a certain um, level or whatever, however you would measure carbon. You're assuming that that's what that was. The other problem is, is that they have carbon dated animals today. They, they carbon dated the shell of a snail that lived today and it came back that it was 100,000 years old. It was alive. It wasn't dead. It was alive. 100,000 years old. Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. The magma cools down and it forms rock. These six, I think it was six, it was six um, Christian science students, they went out and they took pieces of this rock and they went to independent labs all over the place. There was five different labs. And they had this rock that was brand new, brand new formed and they had it tested by five in different labs independently. The youngest was 100,000 years old. The oldest was like 3 million years old. Rock that just formed from the eruption of Mount St. Helens. It's not reliable. That's not, you can't date something like that. That's not science. That's a guess. The second way, the second way, the biggest proof they have is the stars. Since science has been able to, um, since they've been able to witness or look at the stars and they've been able to, take any data down, they've noticed and it's consistent that stars move consistently away from the earth. That they've continued moving at a consistent speed away from the earth. So they say, well, if you reverse that and you say, well, it took them that long to get there, if you reverse that around, it would have taken them a billion years to get back to earth. Well, you're starting with the same problem. You're assuming that they were ever here. You don't know that they were ever here to get there. The, my Bible says that God flung the stars into existence. I bet they are still moving. God threw them. I'm sure they won't ever stop moving. When God throws something, it won't stop. You're assuming things. That's not science. Science is something you can reproduce. You can retest. And then you can, you can call it a theory. And I'm glad they call it that because that's what it is. It's a theory. And if, you, if you're trying to say, trying to assume that the Big Bang Theory is how the world created was, was created and how that happened... You're just going to keep running into all these problems. When I was, I was looking into this, 
And, and I found that the odds of the Big Bang are basically impossible. At the time the Big Bang Theory was coined or theorized, or however you would say that, there were between three and five known parameters that it would take for life to sustainably exist on Earth. Five. Okay? There are now 200 known parameters known by science, all of which, if any one was moved in either direction, even slightly, life could not sustain on Earth. 200 different parameters that would have to meet perfectly. You have Earth's gravity. You have the position that we sit in, re in relativity to the sun, where we sit um, according to the sun. You have the fact that we sit on a 23 and a half degree axis, um, the rotation of the Earth spinning at 24 hours a day, right? Do you know that we were, if we were any closer to the sun or any further from the sun, we would either burn to death or freeze? The, some of the numbers, I, I wouldn't even write them down. They were so insane, the numbers, some of these things. Gravity, however they measure gravity, it says that gravity is 10 to the 59th power. That is 10 with 59 zeros behind that. If you changed even one of those numbers, life could not sustain on Earth. Amen. If you changed our axis... Even, it's, the, it's the most minute things. You guys should look it up. It's called fine-tuning. It's something. It's, it's, it's basically God's fine-tuning on the creation of the universe. It's all these different things. I just gave you four parameters. There are 200. The odds are better. The odds are better for you to take a box, put springs, nuts, bolts, glass, and metal in it, and shake it up and make a Rolex. Amen. The odds are better for that Amen. than the earth just appearing. Then Earth just then all these things just exploding, right? They've made God into a fairy tale. They've changed God into a fairy tale, so they don't fear Him. There's no there's no fear of Him. Verse eight says, "Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him." See, when you've reduced God down to a comfort, then then you have no need for Him because it's just a comfort. God is just something we do when things get real bad. If our life gets, starts getting real bad, we might call some people we know that go to church. If, if something gets real bad, we might call a preacher we know. And if, if, if we just can't get it all figured out, we might come to church. That's fine. We'll make room for you. There's always room for you here. The problem is, is once your problem is solved, then you will be gone too. Because you're only here for a need. You have a need that you need filled. When that need becomes filled, you have, no longer have a need. You won't come. Because there's no fear of God. There's a need for comfort. A need for help. There's no need. There's no. There's no just awe of him. Now, for this is this is something that I remember. I was only in third grade when this happened, but I can remember it. And I've heard people talk about it all, so many times. Um, when 9/11 happened, they said that the church is packed out. That people were everywhere. You couldn't find a seat. They were, everywhere was full for a month or two. Then the panic died down. Nobody was scared anymore. The comfort was there. Everybody was not, it was okay. We didn't need church anymore. That, that's, that, we don't stand in awe of him until judgment takes place or until tragedy strikes and then we want, then we want help. But you waking up this morning was worthy of praising him. That's right. The fact that you made it here, the fact that you had food to eat this morning, that's right. we don't deserve any of those things. So if we don't deserve them, then they're all by grace and by love. So then, then we need to stand in awe of him for the things that he does for us. Just the fact that he hasn't wiped this world out of existence for the sinful horribleness of it is amazing. That's a that's a it's grace. Um, verse nine says, "For he spake and it was done; he commanded and it stood fast." I think that's just amazing. You know, I love it. I'm telling you, there's nothing I love more than my God. I love him. I'm so proud of him, and I and I, I would defend him against anybody because I know that what this says is true. Amen. What this says is real, and I can stand on this. I'm not, I don't follow just some good teacher. I don't follow somebody that died on a cross a long time ago and just stayed dead. No, he's alive and he's still living and he's, he is the teacher. He's not just a good, this isn't just a good idea. This isn't just something like that some people think that the Bible is just like a, a, just some good guy wrote it and it's just a bunch of good thoughts and a good way to live your life by or a guideline for your life. That's not, that's not what it is, but that's the, it's the reason that, we, that the world's the way it is now. I'm just glad that people's perspective doesn't change who he is. He is who he is regardless of what you think about him. He is what he is regardless of, of what you don't think about him. That's right. um, a lot of people in the Old Testament didn't understand. Pharaoh didn't fear God. Pharaoh didn't fear God for who he was. He had to be shown, right? You look at Uzzah. 
Uzzah was carrying the cart that the Ark of the Covenant was on, for one, it was supposed to be, it had rings in it, it was supposed to be bared on your shoulder. They had it on a cart. For two, nobody was supposed to touch it. For three, only the Levites were supposed to have it, and Uzzah wasn't a Levite. He didn't fear God, and it cost him his life, because he wasn't listening. You look at um, Nadab and Abihu. They brought strange fire before the Lord. And it, they died for it. This, we need to be thankful that God's judgment doesn't work this, sometimes the same way. God used to sometimes exact his judgment right then. As soon as it happened, the strange fire came and they were devoured. The ark fell, he touched it, he died right there. There was, no, there was no time in between that. He died instantly. But God, living in the age of grace, there is, there is complacency. There is, it's okay, you can mess up. And once you, once you realize and once you kind of test, just like a child, how they test the boundaries of their parents. They test what they can get away with. Well, you start testing and testing and testing. Well, you haven't died yet. God hasn't struck you dead. God hasn't done. So you keep pushing and pushing until, until something does happen. Or until you're so far gone that now you don't even know how to get back. The fear of God will come. Because it says in the last days that the sun, moon, and stars will be darkened. That the, mer- that the earth is going to melt with a fervent heat. Then every knee will bow and every knee will confess that He is God. Then they'll be afraid. Then the fear will come. Every nation, every army, every tongue is going to confess that He is God. They'll be afraid then. They will will bow to Him in reverence and fear. But it's not the same thing. Verse 10 says, Verse 10 says, The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the the devices of the people to none effect. Not means nothing. Um, sometimes you'll hear people talk about double not or not not a zero zero or or they use it a lot of times in like grading and surveying and stuff. Nothing. It means zero nothing. The council of the heathen. If you took all the greatest minds of every person that's on earth right now, I don't know whoever Bill Gates, uh, what's the other guy? Yeah, all the all the smart guys, right? If you took every one of them and you put them in a room together and they were able to think and use anything at their at their um, disposal to come up with. It would all be as nothing before God. That's it's right. not nothing. That's right. And for example, right? Like there is nobody in this world, nobody on earth ever living that ever ever has lived that can explain to you where life came from. God tells us where life came from. Nobody can explain to you where life came from or where it goes. I'm not talking about keeping a heart beating. A machine can do that or, or the different thing. I'm talking about the life, the living soul that is in somebody. And when they pass away and it leaves their body, nobody knows where that is, where that goes, or how that gets there. Scientists' best explanation is that um, a long time ago, the earth was like this hot ball of magma, and it rained on and it cooled, and it made a crust, kept raining, and it filled up with water. Somehow, in this water, um, a single-cell organism appeared. Um, I looked this up. I'm not kidding. It just appeared. <laughs> and somehow it appeared and it found something to eat, found something else like it, made another one. I don't know. They have no, the origin of life. There is no answer. There, there may be theories. There may be new theories and other theories, but there is no answer for where life came from. But God said he breathed and it became. That's right. See, God answered all these questions that nobody else can answer in the first few words of the Bible. It says, in the beginning, God. God knew that that would be a question. God knew that would be a problem. God knew that that would make it be a stumbling block for some people. So he just got it out of the way and he answered it. The first thing you read is, in the beginning, God. That's important. Because it, it just, by the first thing you read is you know who God is and you know the power because in the beginning, he did it. Amen. So, um, life, I have a lot more stuff on that, but there's basically no way to recreate it. They can't recreate it. You can't bring somebody back to life. Once they're gone, they're gone. Science has no way to bring it back to life. They don't know how to start it, stop it, or how to recreate it. Um, verse 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. See, that's the catch though, right? This country was founded on a fear of God, and for hundreds of years maybe we were a Christian nation. But I'm telling you right now that you live in the buckle of the Bible belt, and you can see it here. Right. You can see here this nation and this country and this State is losing a fear for God. It's not, it doesn't exist like it did anymore. Um, they treat God just like it's a joke, right? Like your politics, um, schools, communities, our, our nation everywhere is turning their back on God. And what, what's going to happen is, is God is going to take his hand off of America. And when that happens, it's going to be bad. 
And then everybody's going to go running back. Everybody's going to want. Everybody's going to want help. Everybody's going to want God, but it's only going to be when the judgment falls and when judgment happens. So, I think that one of the big problems is that people are just scared of the wrong thing. People are afraid, and their fear is in the wrong place. I have an example. I did some research. Okay, you don't have to raise your hand. You can if you want to. How many people in here? have at least a gun, a firearm, something to protect their home from a in home invader, some kind of a way to protect their home and their family. Okay? Well, that's great. In America, 84 people a year die from home invasion. Okay? How many people in their house have a working fire extinguisher? 3,800 people die every year. Because of house fires. But way more people have a gun than they do a fire extinguisher. Sorry. They're scared of the... Yes, ma'am. Can I say something? Our son is going to start driving a gasoline tanker truck. And Reggie and I were talking about how dangerous that job is. And I looked at Reggie and I said, you know what? He's got the best protection he could ever get. He's got power on him. That's right. That's right. Yep. That's the problem. We're scared of the wrong thing. We're ready for this home invader to come in because everybody thinks they're like, all, like you see all these movies and all these things happening. But in actuality, you are 45, more, 45 times more likely to die in a house fire than you are for a home invader. Our fear is in the wrong place. We're scared of the wrong things. This world and this earth, like we're so scared of uh, the economy crashing or a war taking place or like the sickness, but our fear needs to be in God. And in God alone. And, and if your fear is in the right place, then you're not afraid of all those things. Those right. things don't matter to you. Right. I mean, if COVID showed us anything, is that, that like a little fear can cripple the world. Yes. The entire world shut down. That's right. I understand people have like crazy things can do. I'm not saying that it wasn't bad. I'm saying that, that a little fear shut down the world. Imagine what if everybody had that same amount of fear for God. Amen. Yes. Amen. We might be all right. We might be able to actually do something. We might be able to be productive for God. We might be able to actually make a difference. We might be able to... The things we could do would be amazing. Verse 13 and 14 says, The Lord looketh from heaven, and he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. So no matter where you go, no matter where you are, there is nowhere you can go that God isn't. That's right. He is in infinitely beyond you. There is, to me, that all this is just speaking like to his vastness, but you can't wrap your head around God. And a lot of people, that if they can't explain it, they dismiss it. Right. If they can't wrap their head around it, it's not real. But that's the catch. If you could explain God, if you could understand him and wrap your head around him, he wouldn't be God. That's right. God is not something for you to attain or understand or, or comprehend. That's not what he is. Right. So... If it, he is outside of space, time, reality, like he's outside of all those things, and he, he exists whether you believe he does or not. His existence is not hinging upon your believing. He is. He is who he says he is. He loved you. He died for you. Amen. He loves you if you don't love him. Amen. He died for you whether you accept it or not. That's right. He loves you and he died for you, and that doesn't change whether or not you accept it or believe it. Verse 15 says. He fashioned their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. He knows everything about you. To fashion something means to create it, right? He fashioned their hearts. He knows you intimately. He knows you on levels that nobody knows you, in ways probably you don't even know yourself. Because we're not really good at self assessment. We're not good at, we think high, more highly of ourselves than we are. We don't see the flaws in ourselves. We don't. You know, a lot of times somebody will point something out to us, this big flaw or something, we're like, how dare they? Right. But everybody sees it. We don't see it. We're really bad at that. But God, God sees us not for just what we do, not for what we say, not for our actions, but for the intents. He's able to judge you because of the intents. That's awesome, right? You, excuse me, you can't manipulate him. Right. And that's what this world wants. They want to be able to manipulate. Because if you can manipulate, then you can... Move it in your favor. You can make it look like something it's not. And then also, you don't have to really be that. Like, I think that's why everybody loves like social media, social media so much. Because you can paint a really pretty picture. Right. 
You can be like the greatest family ever. You can have the most amazing life and go to all these cool places and nobody sees you crying all the time or fighting with your wife all the time or like that you're miserable or like you can, you can manipulate the narrative. And a lot of times I think that with, with just people in general not being able to manipulate, God scares them. That they're afraid. I think even sometimes like Christians are afraid to be open in front of God. They're afraid. He already knows. Like a lot of times, like I've heard sometimes people pray. Like you'll hear somebody pray, and they'll say, "Oh, thou most holy heavenly Father." If you want to pray like that, that's fine. If that's how you really talk to God, but if that's not what you mean, then you're just putting on an act. Like. Sometimes you just like can't even talk. You're just so hurt and heart and like you're having such a hard time. Right. God doesn't need you to be this fake person. God doesn't need, God knows you. Amen. He loved you where you were. He accepted you for who you were when you were lost. You don't have to be this shined up pretty person. You just need to be honest and open with God because it puts a distance between you and God when you're trying to be something that he knows you're not. Like for example, if Xavier were to lie to me and I know the truth it makes it worse. It makes it makes me more mad because I know he's lying to me than if I just think he is. If I'm like, I don't really know if he did or not, but I, don't, I think he's lying. But if I know for certain that he's done something, and I'm like, did you do that? And he's like, no. I'm like, son, like, I wouldn't ask you if I didn't know the answer to it. I was telling that. But that's how it is with God. That's how it is with God because when you go to God and you talk to him, he doesn't need pretty words. He doesn't need this elegant, thought-out prayer. He just needs you to talk to Him. He just wants you to talk to Him all day long. That's like you can pray at any point in time. You can just be talking to Him. When I, sometimes I pray, and I always start my prayer with, Dear Heavenly Father, and I end it in Jesus' name. But throughout the prayer, sometimes I'm working and talking, just like I'm talking to you guys, because He's my friend. That's right. Because he's, he's like a father to me. He's like, I can, I can talk to Him about anything and be me. Because when I'm, when I'm not me, that's when I get in a mess. Um, to him. Um, sorry, I got off topic. Um, but that's how he can judge righteously. Because he does know your intents and in your, in your works. Imagine if he didn't judge righteously. Imagine if he just judged you based on the person you present. If he just judged you on like the best you could do. See, when you get to heaven, all your deeds and works are going to be thrown on a fire. And what that is, is... Fire purifies, and it will either burn up or it will purify. So what that's doing is it's taking everything, every word, every deed, every thought, everything that you've done, and it's refining it down to its pure intent, its purest form, where your heart was. Because you can do something nice and have um, a bad heart about it. You can help somebody and... And resent it at the same time. You, you can do something because you know God would appreciate it. Or people are watching and it's a nice thing to do. Or you know what I mean? Like like if people are watching you and you're putting money in the offering plate. And you're like, well, these people can see me. I better put a 20 instead of a 5 or something. That's not the right heart. That's not, that's not like the Bible says not to let your left hand know what your right's doing. Y'all just grab a whole bunch and throw in there. But w- when you're doing it because you're like. Oh, I want everybody to know that I'm doing this. Or your intents or, or can can get you in a in a problem. So the thing, the the most important thing from all of that is that is that we need to get back to a fear of God. We do things out of the love and the reverence and the respect for God that we have, not because not because like the world says we should or we think we should. We need to do things for being in awe and and, and just loving Him. Um, the Bible says that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But that's not scary to us. That's not scary to me. The Bible says also that to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. So it's a fearful thing for those that don't know Him. That's it's right. a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God if you don't know who He is when you get there. Amen. But if you know Him, if you're His child, if you're saved, that's not scary at all. So those are the kind of where your fear um, can be misplaced to me. The biggest fear I could think of would be like a day without him. That's right. Would be like if I went to pray and he didn't hear me, or if I went to read and I couldn't hear him, Amen. or if I couldn't feel him, 
If I couldn't feel that, just that, that comfort, that, that indwelling of the Holy Spirit, if I couldn't feel that, that is terrifying. That's what I'm afraid of. That's, that's what's scary. Verse 18 That's right. That's right. Um, verse 18 says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, upon them that hope in His mercy. So there is comfort in the fear, right? I fear Him because I know Him. I know the God that the Bible reveals, right? And not only about what He can do, but what He has done. He loved me. He left heaven. He died for me. I love Him. I respect Him. I reverence Him because I know how small I am. I know how fragile my life is. I know how just how small I am. And I know that the safest place that I can be is in God's will. And I know that even if everything is falling apart, if everything is falling apart, and sometimes that's what it feels like. Sometimes it feels like you're just giving it everything you got and it ain't enough. And it ain't, it ain't working out. And just it's like one thing after another thing after another thing. But as long as you know that you're in God's will, you're safe. I know it's... People have said it a lot, but like a hurricane is insane and crazy, but right in the center of it, in the eye of it, it's calm. That's like God's will. If you're in the will of God and in the center of that, you're safe. There's no safer place no matter what you're going through. There is no safer place than in the will of God. Um, verse 19 says, To deliver their souls from death and to keep them alive in famine. So the thing, the thing that, that really happens... Sorry, I skipped a verse there. No, okay. To deliver their souls from death and to keep them alive in family. Yeah, the world, the world hates him. And I don't understand. I don't get that. It's hard to understand that because I guess like even um, when I was lost, I knew about God. I knew who He was, and I still like, like I had a like a respect for Him in some kind of way. And maybe that's just like we're in the South, we're raised like that. Like God, everybody knows about God, but there are people that really that really hate Him. And they've just like convinced he's, they're convinced themselves that he's not real, and then they convince themselves that as a Christian, like you're missing out. It, it's all these rules that there's no fun. But I think that like they don't understand that I'm just now free. I'm just now living. I'm just now like I'm just now alive. And we're all going to go through trials. The Bible says that it rains on the just and the unjust. Right? That means everybody's going to go through the same things because it's going to rain on them just like it's going to rain on you. But guess what? I know who makes the rain. So as long as you're saved, as long as you know Him, and as long as you're, as long as you're aware and, and you're saved and you're with Him, then even if it's raining, it's okay. And verse, the, the verse, at the end of the verse, it says that He'll keep them alive in famine. Now, it's important right there because it doesn't say that He'll keep them from famine. It doesn't say that He will keep them out of the famine. It says He will keep them in the famine while they're in the famine. It reminded me of the story of Joseph. And Joseph was like, a, you know, enslaved. He was sold into slavery. He was accused. He was in prison. All these different things. Why? The whole point of it was to save the people of Israel from the famine. And he goes in, and he's in the he's in the prison. And Pharaoh has this dream, and he interprets the dream, and he tells them that they need to store up food, and that they need to, there's going to be all these years of famine, and all these years of plenty. Um, Genesis 45. I need a bigger day. Genesis 45, 5 through 8 says, Now therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves, that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he that hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. God put Joseph through all that stuff to save Israel, to save the people of Israel. So he kept them through that famine. That's what God can do for you. And sometimes we get in these situations that we, we don't understand and we don't know. But as long as our fear is in the right place and our love and our respect for God is in the right place, then we know that the Bible says that all things work together for good for those that love him. That's right. right? So we can hold on to that and hold on to that truth. 
Verse 20 says, Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. God's power is, is where it's safe. You can fear Him, but you shouldn't be afraid of Him. Right? There's a difference in fearing and being afraid. And I'm just glad He's on our side. Right? Like, we are His church. We are His people. We are His... He loves us. Right. If He died for us, then you know He'll fight for us. Right? So, I just wouldn't want to be the one to mess with His children or His people or His church. That's a scary place to be the ones messing with His... Because I know what I do for, for Him. That's right. And if my love that is earthly, I'd give my life for Him. I know that. Amen. Without a doubt. I have no question in my mind I'd give my life for His. And if, if God has already done that, then what more will He do for you in, like, to stand up for you, to take care of you, Amen. to deliver you? That's what He does. That's who He is. He is our help. And the world craves help, right? Every. TV show, every book, every doctor, they're all trying to sell help. That's what they're that's right. they're trying to sell something to you so that you can get help. That's right. But none of that's gonna help. They need to go to the source. I'm talking about the literal source, like the Alpha and the Omega source. Like he, from the beginning, he's been the source of everything, and that's where the, our help comes from. And if America could do could get back to a place where they fear God, then maybe we could get back to where we're like one nation under God again. Because right. they're trying to take that away. And that, that's, that's it's just all the, these different problems that all stem from our fear being in the wrong place. 12, or verse 21 says, For our hearts shall rejoice in Him because we have trusted in His holy name. There's no greater feeling in the world than knowing you're saved. That's right. I said there's no greater feeling in the world than knowing you're saved. Hey. There we go. <laughs> if you're lost, I'd definitely be afraid. That's right. You've got something to be afraid of if you're lost, right? But if you're saved, what is there to be afraid of? You can't go to hell. You can't lose your salvation. Nothing happens outside of His say-so. There is nothing that happens in this world without God's say-so. It doesn't happen. So if you know that and, and you trust in that, then you shouldn't be afraid. Our flesh is what gets afraid. Our, our flesh is what gets scared. But our spirit inside, because we are indwelt with the Holy Ghost, knows the truth. And that's why there's always this conflict. There's always going to be a conflict. Because you have two natures that you that dwell in you all the time. You, it's like, I know it's silly, because there's like, like the little cartoons with like an angel on one side and a devil on the other side. That's not how it is. But it almost is, because there's a, there's a flesh nature to you and a, a spirit and a spiritual nature to you. And those two are at conflict all the time. Your flesh tells you to be scared. The Holy Spirit tells you it's okay. Amen. Your flesh tells you to get angry. The Holy Spirit tells you to stay calm and it's okay. Like, you, you have all these emotions. Uh, emotions is a flesh thing. Like, these, these irrational emotions. You're getting angry and upset and scared and all these different things. Those are, those are flesh things. Those are things that Jesus experienced in His flesh, right? But what He said, He said, my, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. Your flesh is the problem. So, um, but like, when we get afraid and when we get scared and we get all this anxiety and all these different things, we just need to remember that we need to remember who's in control. Because either God is in control or He's not. Either He's in control of everything or He's in control of nothing. There's no in between. There's no gray area. Either you're saved or you're lost. Either He's in control of your life and you're okay or... If you're lost, then you have every reason to be afraid. You have every reason to be terrified. Because the next bad thing that happens, it could be the end. It could be something bad for you. It could be like the economy crashing. Let's go into war, nuclear weapon, whatever. That's something to be terrified of if you're lost. Matthew 28. Matthew 10, 28. says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear Him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's where our fear needs to be. It's not who can kill the body. It's not anything that can happen to your flesh. We need to be not afraid of anything that can happen to your flesh, but only afraid of things and something that can affect your soul and your spirit. Um, the world could crash tomorrow, but either God is who He says He is or He's not, and you'll be okay or you won't. Like either It's one way or the other. We, we, it's it's kind of contradictive, though, because we'll trust Him with our souls... And with our eternity, but then we get scared when we turn the news on. Right. We're afraid the world's going to end tomorrow and we're going to have to live in a bunker or something. Not if God doesn't say so. Well, we have to remember too that God doesn't give us the spirit of fear. So 
So right. when that when we have that and it's so hard not to, you know, to, to not let that in, but when we are feeling that way, we've got to remember that if it's not from God, right. it's probably from the dead. Right. Um, verse 22 says, Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hope in thee. Our only fear should be in him. We need to respect and reverence him. The word reverence means honor or respect felt or shown a profound adoring. We should look at him in awe and aware of his power, his power to judge, his power to defend, to defeat. But the most important thing is his power to save. That's the most important thing. So as long as we make sure our fear is in the right spot, and if it is, as a church, then we can do something for God. We can, if, it is, if the fear of God is, is in the right place for our family, then we can do something for God. We need to make sure that it is for our family, for our church, because then we can reach our community and then we can help. To, to it, just, it outpours. But if our fear is misplaced and in the wrong spot and you go to fight a fire with a gun, you'll be in trouble. You've got to have the right fear. You've got to know where your fear is placed. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for being able to stand up here again, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you would help to help us all to put our fear where it needs to be. Lord, our fear as a whole and in general is in the wrong place. And we need to make sure, even as Christians, even as, as your children, even that we do have a fear for you, we need to make sure it's the right fear, that it's a healthy fear, that we reverence and respect and obey you, Lord. We love you, and I just pray that you would give this church a burden and a... And, a need, Lord, to just have that fear and to get it correct. In Jesus' name, amen.